Uh, okay, first I will stop sharing. And now I can leave the stage to our speaker, Ladislav. Ladislav, go ahead. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thanks very much for the invite. It's a uh, great pleasure. Um, I will set it up so we can start. Can you see now the full screen? Yes, yes. Now it's uh, it's very good. Mm -hmm. So you can go ahead. Reducing the panels so everything fits in. Uh, so thanks again uh, for the for the invite. Uh, I would just uh, start with a very brief uh, information about the package. Uh, this this presentation is rather uh, small. It's just uh, rather short, but uh, we will then uh, go to GitHub, uh, see the resources that are available for users of OpenID. And finally, I have uh, some set of uh, tutorials that uh, you can uh, go through and uh, explore on your own. Uh, it's all commented. Uh, so I hope it will be a valuable resource for you also in the future if you want to return back to what we did here and uh, refresh. Um, but uh, maybe I will manage to provide additional commentaries to the folks. Uh, so maybe starting with uh, what is the motivation behind the open edit package? Uh, it tries to simplify certain tasks that uh, are uh, kind of routine when you are working with edit coherent data. Uh, some of these can be uh, time consuming if you do them, for example, once per year, or uh, you do certain tasks for one kind of flux, and then you want to uh, or refocus on, uh, for example, from NAE to lot and heat, and uh, suddenly you realize there are certain steps that you would need to redo again. Uh, so uh, this uh, package is allowing you to set up certain workflows and uh, make them uh, repeatable um, and uh, you know, basically uh, do things more efficiently. Uh, so uh, this is covered on this uh, first slide. Uh, so, so why, uh, why open ID? Um, we just want to reduce the amount of time that uh, that users are spending with preparing the datasets. Because uh, if you are the PI of uh, a recovery site, you might uh, spend quite a lot of time uh, with uh, flatten submissions or with producing the, uh, the yearly budgets uh, of different flexes so this is uh, one of the things uh, second thing is that uh, typically uh, packages or software is focused on post-processing steps starting from uh, gap filling and flux partitioning uh, but uh, not much focus is uh, just uh, uh, given to quality control uh, so we basically try to provide in the package uh, certain primitives uh, certain set of minimalistic functions that allow you to uh, build kind of uh, Lego blocks together and apply them in uh, some defined uh, quality control scheme. Uh, this quality control scheme can be uh, defined for all four flexes that are standardly produced by uh, the basic uh, edit coherence system, which is small and two flexes, uh, sensible heat flexes, lot and heat flexes, and uh, CO2 flexes. And what is also common is that uh, quality control done on the edit covariance practice can be very, very subjective uh, and might not be much scalable. If you uh, have multiple stations, you are producing data continuously, uh, you would uh, probably rather automatize this, this process. So this is the second motivation. Uh, and uh, there are also uh, things connected with the plotting if you want to visualize your data. Uh, just comparing a different time series next to each other. Typically, you want to, for example, visualize flexes together with methodological data. Uh, for example, for your analysis, you might want to uh, select a certain period where uh, flexes were affected by drought. Uh, in this case, you want to see when uh, VPD was high, 
uh, when uh, net ecosystem exchange, for example, was uh, was just uh, affected uh, by these extreme conditions. And for this, uh, you might uh, want to have certain uh, extended plotting. So this is achieved within the function two. Uh, there are also aggregations of the flexes. So if you want to have budgets, uh, this is uh, simplified to a great uh, degree. Uh, also, you can have a simplification of uh, uncertainty estimation of the flexes. So uh, here I would just like to uh, put you on the page where we actually fit in within the processing workflow uh, because uh, collection of eddy covariance data and its processing is uh, rather uh, demanding process. Uh, there is the collection of the raw data that can be from 10 hertz to 20 hertz, uh, but it's this uh, raw high frequency data that we collect uh, from the eddy covariance uh, system. Uh, and this is uh, typically uh, the focus of, of many workshops where uh, processing softwares are introduced. You might uh, probably know Edipro. There is also TK3. Uh, there is uh, EDUH, uh, other processing uh, softwares for processing of raw data. Um, this is uh, basically uh, on the picture uh, level zero data, as we call them uh, within within our defined structure uh, of, the, of the levels. Of course, this is kind of arbitrary, uh, but it was set up to, to make some structure within the open edit package. So you might want to uh, maybe uh, change it in some way, but uh, the easiest and the laziest approach is to adapt this, uh, this uh, uh, way of leveling data, just, just to work the DSP package. Uh, so this was uh, level zero, uh, the raw data. Uh, here we are not contributing with open edit. Uh, basically, then we are uh, using the edit output. So we use the post-process data already at the home hourly level. Uh, so it's uh, level one data that we obtain okay, from, from the uh, post-processing software. Uh, oh, sorry, from the processing software edit pro. Uh, in theory, we can actually use uh, different softwares uh, for within, within the uh, package. Uh, the idea here is just that Edipro is standardizing uh, the, the columnase, <clears throat> and therefore it's easier than to navigate across a uh, large quantity of variables. So basically, if you, uh, if you want to run again the, the QC scheme, uh, fast, we are relying on certain naming strategy that is applied in Endipro, also of the formatting of the columns and so on. Uh, so this is greatly reducing the amount of work you have to invest uh, later on uh, during the application of the functions. Um, we are trying to run everything in R, so after you are basically finished with Edipro, uh, you should be able to do 99% uh, of the things uh, in our software. I will just uh, show you later on how to define the uh, footprint or the, sorry, the, the region of interest of the recurrence data where we basically can do the footprint filtering. Uh, this can be done uh, using, using uh, Google Earth engine. Um, so this is the only exception. Otherwise, we stay in R and do all the tasks there. Uh, and we can also use additional packages. So that's the good thing about defining everything in one software that you basically uh, create a continuous workflow where you run from the editor output and finish with the summarized get build quality control uh, budgets and additional information like Windrose's uh, footprint and so on. Um, you can also connect your storage computations this way. Um, so so the, the idea was basically to, to uh, reduce the amount of tedious work with the practicalities connected with the uh, merging of the data, filling gaps in the timestamp and things like that. Uh, 
maybe maybe I can just go to level two. This is uh, this is where we actually do the quality uh, quality control. This is uh, a task done by Open Edit. Uh, we will just uh, go briefly through uh, the options for quality control uh, within the tutorials. Uh, you can also see the, the extended workflow uh, on the GitHub. Uh, and the following step is uh, producing level three data that are get filled, plus partitioned, and summarized. And then here we actually uh, take advantage of our edit proc that was already, I believe, uh, presented here uh, in the last uh, webinar. Uh, this function, uh, sorry, this this uh, package is actually uh, providing the capabilities to get fill and partition. So we basically use uh, use it for for doing this job, and then we only follow up with Open Edit to basically simplify the aggregation of the data. If you want to produce daily sounds, uh, weekly sounds, you want to produce um, uh, yearly uncertainty, your budgets, uh, this can be done uh, following the using Open Edit. So this is uh, in a nutshell how the processing chain looks like. So you start collecting your raw data with your edit coherence uh, system, you feed it into edit pro software. Once you have the output, you do quality control in open edit, uh, then plug in our edit pro package, uh, get the partition, and then uh, summarize using open edit again. Uh, so the most important Part actually one of the main motivations to, to uh, make the package was the quality control. So there will be probably most of uh, the information about about this step. Uh, what is the advantage uh, using the uh, small uh, defined functions is that uh, you can just do this quality control in multiple sub steps. So basically, we define all the conditions and. Uh, under which uh, the instruments could have failed. Uh, there are certain statistical properties of the data that uh, are identifying certain issues. So uh, we can, all of them, uh, just inspect and flag the data that, uh, that have uh, certain unwanted properties and then combine uh, those flags together and uh, filter out the, the flexes. Uh, because we are applying uh, the, the filters uh sometimes they might be dependencies on the order of the steps so this is uh, a little bit of uh, complexity here but uh, we try to reduce it uh, and keep the qc scheme as simple as possible uh, you can test on your own on this low example uh, so the simplification here is that uh, certain filters are already predefined. Uh, they are either extracted from the edit pro output uh, or it's uh, based on our experience or uh, certain papers that were published. Uh, you can just uh, decide which one of them you want to use. So you uh, can have really a full list of uh, QC filters, but uh, really decide just uh, which one is suitable for your site. Um, so also this will allow you to run in case that uh, you do some uh, kind of modifications in the processing uh, using edit pro. Uh, it can allow you to just um, quickly uh, rerun all the following steps. So this is this is kind of uh, an issue if we return back into the processing chain. Uh, basically, all of these are dependent steps. So uh, once you uh, do uh, edit pro processing, uh, this output that you will obtain will be fed into Open Edit. Uh, but if this edit pro input is uh, is actually changing, uh, then you want to do the reprocessing once more. So rerunning uh, is kind of uh, also often happening with the, the recoverance post processing. Um, you also want to probably go through your data and check them visually, uh, even if we apply all reasonable quality filters, 
there might still be uh, some kind of uh, issues remaining. You either want to inspect what might be behind it, or in a case where it's really difficult to find out, you might want to just manually exclude. So the capabilities are, are there. Uh, we also want to make sure that actually we don't uh, remove too much data. So if you uh, if your quality control scheme results in producing 20% of uh, excellent data, uh, it might not be that great because uh, you cannot produce a reasonable budget out of a very small fraction of available data. On the other hand, we just, we just want to uh, work with the reasonable data quality. So here is just a few examples of uh, what uh, quality control filters we are talking about. Uh, this is not a complete list, but uh, probably the most famous is the steady state and test of uh, turbulence uh, characteristics test, uh, which are uh, basically uh, the standard. Uh, they are uh, available already in Edipro as a QC column with just the prefix QC and the flux name. Uh, basically, we just give it a suffix uh, SSIPC to, to distinguish it and, and make sure that uh, it's clear that uh, this, is, this is this type of quality control. So there is no computation added to it. It's just reformatting. Uh, additional things that are described here are, for example, the plausibility limits. Uh, if you go into edit prom, uh, into edit pro uh, full output uh, variables description. Uh, you can see uh, that, uh, that there are these limits mentioned and you can explore uh, how they are actually obtained. It's basically uh, giving you a flag in case uh, your measurements have uh, crossed certain limits that are reasonable for a given variable. So for example, if we are measuring uh, using uh, sonic anemometer wind speeds that are over 100 uh, uh, or sorry over 30 meters per second for example it doesn't make any sense uh, there are certain limits that uh, it should be uh, like if the values are above uh, this is actually checked within the raw signal so this is uh, something that you cannot replicate using the half hourly estimates so this is uh, taking advantage of the uh, computations done on the raw files. Uh, and uh, replicating this would take quite a considerable amount of time. So we are just uh, loading the statistics that are available in Edipro and trying to work with them and taking maximum out of what we know about the raw data. Uh, one of the additional things, for example, that we can get uh, from the raw files is the spike percentage. So how spiky your data is, uh, what is uh, the expectation is that if uh, the spikes are forming more than 1%, for example, of your data set, it's already affected and shouldn't be used for further computations. Uh, there shouldn't be also too many missing data. So this is uh, uh, too many missing raw data. So this is missing fraction uh, uh, filter. Uh, another could be spectral correction factor. This is actually uh, based on the value of the spectral correction factor that uh, is giving you information uh, about how much uh, was the actual estimate uh, corrected for spectral losses. So if you get, for example, only one third of the signal and two thirds are the correction, uh, this is a good uh, indication that the half hour shouldn't be used anymore because we are basically guessing that the two thirds of the information, uh, the correction is too large. So this is uh, another example, uh, just maybe not to uh, spend all time here. You can you can just uh, read also the there is on multiple locations on GitHub, uh, also within the open edit documentation, uh, there are uh, explanations uh, about each test. For example, this interdependency test, 
there is a link into Matthias Mauder's uh, paper. So sometimes there are also papers linked, and we can just explore uh, what what is behind it and why we should filter such data. So what is what is important to to also mention is that uh, we will be producing quite a lot of columns. Uh, these columns will be rather simple. It's uh, just uh, containing flags. Uh, these flags will be uh, having numerical values. Uh, they will be from zero to two. They are integers, so uh, no decimals. It's just that if you have a flag zero, it's excellent quality. Uh, if the test uh, gives you flag one, it's uh, quality good enough to produce annual sounds. Oftentimes, uh, it's uh, said that uh, this shouldn't be used for fundamental research. Uh, within the QC scheme that we use here, I would argue that we can actually start to think about uh, like one as a good enough also for fundamental research because we are using uh, more filters at the same time and we just uh, uh, try to exclude uh, data based on uh, many aspects much more than just uh, steady state and integral uh, to do an entire phase to the test. Uh, if you get flag two, uh, this is uh, typically a signal that, that you should remove that volume. Uh, so uh, this is the this is the flagging scheme from zero to two. Uh, what is then uh, described here is the QC prefixes. Uh, this is the naming strategy that is used uh, within the QC scheme. Uh, Either you can uh, just always call the QC filter uh, as uh, relevant to the flex itself. So it can be QC tau, QCH. Uh, this means that uh, this uh, QC filter is really specific to the particle flux. So you cannot use it for anything else. If it has a uh, prefix QCSA, uh, this is abbreviation of sonic anemometer. Uh, and it tells you basically uh, if uh, you produce this kind of filter, uh, it's applicable to momentum fluxes and sensible heat fluxes. Uh, so similar logic applies uh, to the remaining ones. GA is the gas analyzer. Uh, this means uh, this is applicable to latent heat and net ecosystem exchange. Uh, so only the uh, gas analyzer issues are considered. Uh, if there is QC saga, uh, it means basically both uh, are applied. Uh, but in this case, uh, you are not interested in gas analyzer issues uh, for momentum fluxes. So it's again just applicable to a lot of heat and EU. Uh, in case of uh, QC all, basically you produce just one column. So this is the main reason. Uh, if we are uh, just evaluating uh, uh, like a larger number of uh, filters, we don't want to have uh, for each uh, filter one single, uh, sorry, for each flux, you don't want to have a separate column. So for some cases, you can just simplify and produce one column, call it QC all, and it's applicable to all fluxes in this case. This could be, for example, the situation for Fetch filter, where you are uh, filtering your data based on your footprint. If, if the uh, if your uh, measurements are coming outside from outside of the area of interest or budget area, uh, you just want to filter out the data, and this can this can be applicable to, to all fluxes. Uh, the next thing is the QC suffixes. So. If we if we name the the flexes uh, with some prefix, uh, we follow with what kind of filter it was actually specified. So then the column names have uh, kind of predefined names. They are not words, so you can change them. It's just that uh, all the guides and uh, tutorials that are available will be much simpler if you if you will not be changing those uh, those uh, names. Uh, 
these suffixes are explained in the, on the GitHub also, and they were already mentioned on the previous slides in the brackets. Uh, so this is the uh, naming that makes it like reasonable to read and uh, hopefully it's still understandable if you just see this kind of suffix, for example, uh, upslim, hopefully you can still guess that this was uh, absolute limits, uh, which is just uh, one of the focus that I like. Uh, what is also uh, one thing to consider is that uh, uh, you might uh, have a certain uh, different different expectations if you are submitting data for example for a flatman uh, to, to a flatman database or if you want to create a, a budget of, of your flexes yearly budget uh, maybe the QC can be slightly different when submitting to flexnet uh, maybe you don't want to remove uh, Flex is based on the fetch because this uh, would be done within the infrastructure, uh, software infrastructure that the day apply. Uh, if you want to do fundamental research, maybe you want to be more strict with your QC. So you can also add up this uh, to particular uh, application that you, that you would plan with the data. Uh, here is just uh, a very visual slide, uh, just showing. Uh, how the how the plotting can look like. Uh, this is this is one of the ways uh, you can visualize uh, flexes together with uh, meteorological variables. Uh, we will see that in the tutorial. Maybe I can just uh, explain a little bit more what's going on on the plot. We just uh, see one week of uh, data. Uh, in the middle panel, there is uh, an EE. Net ecosystem exchange. Uh, in the black dots, we can see the used data. And uh, uh, if they are purely black, it means that they are of the best quality. If they are overlaid with a green color, it already means that the flag, uh, the overall flag uh, was uh, one. Uh, so it's still good enough, but it's not the best volume. And if uh, the flag was two, the dots will be colored red. And it's also on the gray field, so it's ex excluded data. Uh, maybe it's not so well visible, but uh, from the top of the middle panel, there are a few bars that are of uh, blue color. These are precipitations. Uh, the axis is on the right side, so precipitation in millimeters. Uh, what is also going on in the plot is uh, that there are uh, there is a visualization of the uh, gap fill uh, values of NEE. So this is the green line. So you can see where actually the gap fill values will go if the data are not available. Uh, you can also see ecosystem respiration. That is the red line, and you can see also blue. Uh, line that is shown in GDP. Um, the legends maybe are not perfectly visible. They are on the left side and on the right side of the menu plot. So hopefully this can help to navigate. Uh, on the top panel, there is air temperature, soil temperature, and fire. They are distinguished by color. So, so incoming radiation is a uh, yellow one or golden. And then now uh, so cell temperature is red. And again, the, there is um, axis on left and right side just for maximum efficiency using the, the space. So similarly for the bottom panel, uh, there is VPD and uh, net radiation. Uh, so it can clearly help you to just distinguish the dry periods and, and so on. Uh, so there is uh, also plotting uh, showing you the results of the quality control. So it's not only uh, producing columns, but you can also visually uh, inspect what are the outcomes. So if you have uh, really uh, multiple uh, quality control filters uh, applied in some kind of sequence, you can just see from the left to the right on the plot. 
uh, what is the outcome and how this is actually the uh, quality of the data deteriorating. So uh, the amount of available measurements is, is just reducing when you go from left to right. And you can see actually which kind of test is uh, the most uh, uh, excluded excluding your, your values. Uh, yeah, in this, in this uh, slide, I just wanted to, to just uh, compare uh, flagging effectivity. So uh, looking at the quality control scheme, you can just uh, think of uh, three different types of quality control. One would be really minimalistic. You would just apply the standard steady state that you can do integral to Boeing's characteristic test. Uh, that would be the minimal scheme. Uh, also, you could just apply all the available tests that uh, you have within uh, OpenID uh, possible to apply. This could be considered a full scheme. And then uh, there is something in between. And this requires uh, a bit of experience, but can be informed just by some kind of recommendations that hopefully uh, you can find in the uh, Inquiries workflow that uh, is on the GitHub. And you can see that uh, this middle spot uh, having this recommended uh, quality control can be helpful to reuse the uncertainty uh, of, your, of your estimates uh, to the maximum degree and still keep uh, good quality fluxes in the end. Uh, finally, uh, I think it's one of the last slides. Uh, this is uh, just showing what kind of uh, outcomes you can expect when you are working with the summaries uh, of OpenID. Uh, basically, uh, you can just uh, use the output of RIDProc and produce daily, weekly, and monthly uh, estimates uh, that are it could be averages or it could be uh, daily sums of, of the fluxes. So on the bottom left plot, you can see for our uh, six sites uh, that we are running at different ecosystems, uh, what are the daily sums of NEP? Uh, it's just a nice example of how different types of forests uh, are behaving, um, how it compares with uh, agro ecosystem, how it compares uh, with the wetland measurements. You can see uh, the different phenology, also thanks to uh, spruce sites being evergreen. It's uh, uh, in a big contrast to the uh, broadly deciduous forest, that is the line uh, three and four. Uh, also, there is uh, windrows that you can produce uh, for yearly data or separate it to, to different uh, other periods that you, that you can define. So what we can conclude uh, uh, about OpenID, uh, it's good to have a predefined set of filters uh, that uh, can greatly simplify your quality control processing, uh, quality control steps. And uh, also it will allow you flexibility. So we are not predefining how you should really do the quality control. And I'm basically hoping for the opposite. Hopefully uh, it could uh, allow for more discussion about what um, quality control should consist of. And because it's kind of a messy process, otherwise uh, it's uh, helping to still provide structure and uh, give you also some kind of guidance how to, how to go through it. Especially if you are uh, new to any programs, you just basically establish the tower and you don't have uh, much uh, like, um, your own experience yet, uh, it can be helpful to just give uh, guidance remotely. Uh, on the other hand, it should be said that it's not a solution for everything. So if you have uh, really uh, placement of your edit coverance uh, tower in a place where uh, it's not really suitable, the conditions are, are not good, uh, you have 
uh, uh, you don't have homogeneous terrain. Uh, there are big differences with canopy heights and, and things like that. It's not a solution for these issues. It's just uh, allowing to quality control better uh, for for the standard size in a specific way. Um, it's also good that if you run uh, the QC scheme according to the recommendations, uh, you can identify reasons uh, of uh, why your setup is having problems. So if certain uh, filter is providing you excessive flagging, uh, so, so it's uh, showing large percentage of data should be removed because of certain reason, you can just check why is it uh, going on. Is there an issue with the edit process software? Is there an issue with your raw data? Uh, should you just check particularly what is happening with the instruments and so on? So it can also inform you back. So it's not only uh, removing data, but also uh, somehow informing you about how to improve your medical health setup. Um, and in general way, uh, it's just a set of uh, tools that you can you can apply for for regular collected data. Uh, so I think this is maybe difficult to advertise because we are meeting here as a group of uh, edicovariance focused uh, people. Uh, but for example, if you would be measuring uh, chamber uh, flexes or subflow or different types of data. That are basically collected in a similar way. So you are producing time series. Uh, you are producing uh, measurements that are in similar temporal resolution. Uh, then you can use also the capabilities of Open Eddy to, to visualize uh, those measurements. Uh, so just to summarize, automation saves time. Uh, you just get uh, out of the data the maximum. This is basically uh, within the name of Open Eddy. We just want to open the Eddy covariance uh, for everybody, so it's easy to, to work with it and, uh, and learn from the data the most. Uh, maybe I can just finish with this uh, lookout here. Uh, there is a possibility, thanks to the package, hopefully, to, to just collaborate more within the community and uh, consider additional quality uh, issues that uh, should be just uh, tackled and, uh, and identified and removed from the data set. Um, we can uh, connect uh, other free software to the processing chain. So basically, uh, after you're finished with edit processing, you can run a, a certain script. And uh, if you are Extending those scripts, uh, you can just get more and more outputs. So it depends really what is your expectations. But if you have a lot of synergies within the group, a lot of people are interested in different types of uh, outputs uh, from this one single source, a point system. Uh, you just can uh, uh, have a very rich uh, data output if you connect multiple other packages. Uh, for example, we can produce uh, stomatal conductance estimates, water use efficiency, things like that. For example, using the leaf package. There is only a hint in the tutorials, but uh, I guess you can, you can follow forward. Um, and I'm also happy if anybody from the community is willing to somehow uh, give feedback, um, give some recommendations, would it be appreciated, uh, what kind of functions. It always depends uh, what is the scope of the package, if it would be reasonable to actually implement within this particular one, or if we should do it um, uh, as an additional extension, for example, of the workflow of the package itself. So this would be this would be the presentation. Uh, maybe there are some questions or we can have a bit of a Interaction here. Yeah, so now I, I, I think we can have a very brief break and we can, if uh, anybody has a question, now you can uh, you can put it in the chat or you can just uh, just uh, just raise your hand to us. So, 
So now we can have a few minutes break to for you to ask the question. Uh, so first, ah, uh, so first, so first, I have one. So for the open ID, it uh, filled uh, data based on the flag from ID Pro, or it also create some uh, flag based on some statistical analysis to do TAQC. The, uh, so my question is the open edit built uh, data based on flag made from edit pro or it also do some statistical analysis and create some flag itself to to do the filtering yeah so so very good question uh, this can be confusing because uh, uh, if you are new to the package, maybe it seems like it's doing everything on its own. You are completely right. A lot of the things are just ingested from the Edipro, uh, Edipro outputs, but not all of it. So basically, there are certain functions that you can define completely on your own. So for example, you have experience that uh, if uh, sonic temperature variance is too high, the sensible heat fluxes are not reliable. This can be uh, your finding, and then uh, you just uh, use one of the filters that is available, which is apply threshold, a uh, very uh, simple type of filter, which basically allows you to define the threshold. So you take uh, the variable, in this case with the sonic temperature variance, uh, you just define uh, what is your acceptable range. And for the whole data set, it will just produce you the flags. So basically, it just says, uh, I think that unreliable is uh, outside of this range, like it uh, by flag two. So you will create a column that you can then use uh, within the QC scheme. You can just combine it with the other flags uh, that you produced previously. And then you can exclude all the data and you have it summarized how big percentage of the data was actually uh, removed by this uh, by this filter. You can maybe uh, also decide that there is a certain uh, wind direction, um, sorry, uh, wind sector, which is affected maybe by the tower or something, uh, and you want to remove that particular sector. So there is also a filter for that. So uh, this is all these kinds of like threshold filters, which is just one function uh, within the scheme that you can uh, use for uh, multiple purposes. So filtering based on multiple variables. Uh, but there is, for example, like this interdependence test, which is uh, described in the paper, but uh, is not available in Edipro. So basically it will construct for you uh, how the interdependent interdependence of flexes is actually affecting uh, your your QC and, and it will be applied to based on that. So so I would say it's a little bit like half half and half uh, in the realistic scheme that uh, half of the flex is produced uh, by functional piece of open ID. Uh, some is basically interpretation of the editor outputs. What is also good to good to say is that Edipro outputs uh, using the the additional statistical QC uh, these are coded uh, columns, so they are not super user friendly to to use just on their own. So there is still a little bit of work needed to just deconstruct them to be interpretable for each flex. Uh, so there is. Um, there is a lot of the information extracted from Edipro, but still some work is uh, needed to be done in OpenID to just make it understandable and applicable. Okay, cool, wonderful. So now we are maybe some maybe the, maybe someone in our audience has some question to ask. Uh, if not, I think. Uh, that was a very informative, wonderful introduction about the package. So now we will move on to the very exciting part, which is practice. Okay, so yeah, I just love perfect. So you can go ahead uh, to follow the second section. Thank uh, you. Okay. 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 Yeah. So now there's one question. I did. Mm -hmm. 
and you may uh, want to help us to organize the question part. Yeah, I mean, you can um, see that there is one question from, from Varsha, but like how long the data gap in NEE we can fill? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, actually, uh, this is within the capabilities of our edit prog, so not, not really the, the scope of uh, open edit, but uh, I can say that uh, this is definitely uh, a thing that uh, should be always considered. So similarly to the quality control that is provided in OpenID, uh, that is not solution for all issues, uh, you also cannot uh, get fill all the data sets. So if the gap is really too large, uh, our EduProc uh, will even inform you uh, about this gap is too large to get fill. So I think, uh, so I think it's, it's actually uh, already captured by uh, Thomas Wiesler. Uh, he programmed some, some kind of uh, threshold. If the gap is too large, it will not allow you to proceed. I think, I think the current state is like this. Uh, there is follow-up question, uh, probably. Uh, yeah, yeah, so, so it's a good one from Bio. Uh, if, if the R Edipark package is modified, if open it will still run. Uh, this is something that uh, I'm trying to work on, uh, that there is this continuous support because basically I'm uh, myself relying on, on this fact that uh, this interdependency will work. So uh, unfortunately so far, open edit is not shared on CRAN. So maybe maybe people know that there is this database of R packages uh, on CRAN. Uh, and you need to fulfill certain conditions with the package to be part of it. Uh, I still didn't port the package, but it should be uh, fulfilling those re uh, requirements. Uh, once we are on CRAN, uh, I would really have this responsibility and otherwise I'm doing it anyway to, to always just keep uh, these two aligned. So there is there is definitely dependency on RD Proc and uh, I'm just trying to follow what is the development and adapt in, in case uh, there is some divergence that wouldn't be uh, compatible with the current state. Within. Thank you. Anybody else having some questions? Yeah, maybe we can now move on to the part two and learn some, you know, maybe we can do some practice or exercise. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So I wanted to, to share with you uh, first this uh, GitHub page where you basically have everything needed. Uh, so if you go to, maybe I can just post and uh, share. If you go on, uh, in this GitHub, you basically get uh, everything uh, that uh, I accumulated, like this uh, explanations about different aspects of OpenID. So in uh, OpenID uh, GitHub, if you click on that repository, repository this is, uh, of course, the package itself. So you can see a very brief overview. The most important thing is how to install it. So if you still didn't uh, install the package, uh, uh, on your computer, you can just follow these two simple steps to, to get it. Uh, I hope uh, everything should be should be fine in this respect. Uh, also good uh, to notice uh, is that there was a recent push. I, I just uh, included a new version of the package. I was working uh, for some time on uh, uh, several improvements, so I wanted to have it uh, out before this workshop. Uh, so it's uh, several days. Uh, I don't know when was the last. Um, I think last week uh, I pushed uh, the last changes. So if you if you just did recent uh, recent installation, uh, you don't have to uh, reinstall. But if, if you installed before or sorry longer than one one week before, um, 
maybe maybe just we run the installation again. So so here you just uh, get a brief uh, feeling about uh, what is possible with the package, but uh, because it's difficult to share large data sets on uh, GitHub, uh, I'm just using the data set that is uh, supplied by RID Proc. So the demonstration cases here are kind of limited. We will see more in the open -ended tutorials later. Uh, what I would like to share also is this uh, region of interest boundary. So if you go uh, in this GitHub page, uh, you will get the description of actually what region of interest is. So I don't know if it's visible or what is on my screen, this picture. Yes. 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 Thank you. So, so here is uh, just the definition, uh, or, or you can just simply see what, what the region of interest could be for your site. So if you have a uh, measurement, uh, sorry, category and system installed, this is uh, here uh, shown by the cross. Uh, so we are measuring on the agro site uh, in this position. And we have uh, certain obstructions here. These are buildings, they are producing uh, CO2, uh, there is also uh, some activity, human activity in this region. So we would like to uh, discard measurements coming from this part. So basically we define uh, the region of interest only within the boundaries uh, here. Uh, this is a little bit zigzagging just because uh, there is a certain angular resolution. And this is what actually the R will uh, ingest so uh, if you provide this kind of region of inter interest uh, boundary, uh, you can filter uh, your fetch distances against this. So if uh, your fetch is coming from farther behind the uh, boundary, it will be excluded. This, this uh, hour will be excluded. So uh, this is just a visual impression of how the a region of interest could look like. Uh, here is a complete description of how the computations could be done. So if you go into the R folder, uh, you can just uh, see the two R scripts that uh, allow you to set a uh, Roy boundary and also display. So basically uh, produce, produce this, this picture that we saw here. So this is this is one one resource that is rather focused on just this one topic uh, of defining your uh, basically target area. Uh, then there is Edicorian's workflow, uh, and here this is uh, basically a list of uh, four scripts. Uh, there are. They are enumerated, so there is data preparation step, quality control step, then there is gathering and flux partition step, and finally summarization. So in these four uh, R, uh, R files, you can just uh, read all the all the commands that you can use on the example data set to produce um, reasonable post processing of your data. Uh, here is uh, also a lot of explanations what is uh, included in each of the steps, uh, what could be the content, uh, contents of your uh, folders, uh, if you want to also archive, uh, archive the, the data later on, and some just general explanations. So hopefully you can then go through it. Uh, these are also some parts that you saw in the presentation. So with some of the aspects, you will already uh, be familiar. Uh, here is, uh, I believe, complete set of filters that you could be applying, but uh, maybe some of them, uh, I would have to check if, if this is, if this is uh, com uh, totally complete. Um, and here, a list of references. So you can just uh, read it through here. And now we can go to the open ended tutorials. Uh, maybe we can reshare the link uh, that I was providing previously also. Yeah, thanks. 
Okay. So, so the problem is that uh, if you if you have any currents that are and meteorological that are uh, it's a lot of columns, it's for the whole year. It's half hour resolution, so the files are typically like rather big. Uh, so GitHub has certain limitations about the uh, amount of data that you can just upload. Uh, so I would like you to use up this this limit. Uh, so I'm sharing the data set uh, through the senator. So it's uh, maybe a little bit less comfortable, but hopefully still still doable for you. Uh, what would be what would be the best uh, if you can? Uh, Um, if you can uh, unpack uh, the, the other files into into one folder, and uh, this would be in a way that there will be the data file, uh, which is CSV file uh, called KRP16. This is the abbreviation of the site, uh, and then there would be open edit tutorials. And if you open uh, in R Studio this um, tutorials or well, our markdown file, you will see uh, probably something like this. Uh, let me know if uh, if you have different experience. Um, I don't know. We maybe should wait a little bit uh, for others to catch up, but uh, you can load it using open file and then navigating open tutorials and just open so what is what is actually uh, in the meantime i don't know uh, if people have issues or how they are about the, the progress with, with uh, making everything run i think this is typically taking a little bit of time so we can be patient here. Uh, but maybe in the meantime, I can just share how the markdown files uh, work. Uh, I think it's a really cool thing that uh, allows you to visualize uh, like human readable uh, documents out of the source, uh, source document. So we can switch to source and see how actually uh, the markdown looks like. Uh, under the hood. So this is uh, this is all the tutorials uh, that are available. Uh, but it nicely translates it into this uh, web document form. So I can a little bit slower. So we just saw that you can switch between source and visual. Uh, you can basically uh, show the outline. So we can see that we have six chapters that we could go through. Uh, you can just navigate through the document by clicking on each chapter. Um, you can run uh, the code that is in the boxes. So this is the last uh, explanation of markdown. Basically, you can just uh, either press Control Enter, and it will allow you to run uh, each command separately. And I would really suggest this type of approach. Uh, alternative would be pressing this green button here. So this is like a green replay or play button. And this will allow you to run the whole chunk together. Yeah, so. Um, I hope that uh, most of the people uh, are on the same page. Should we wait a little bit more or how people feel about it? Yeah, so I think when I, I installed the uh, open edit, it, it showed that I needed to update uh, the HTML tools as uh, several packages. So I updated the other packages as uh, mm -hmm. Uh, in advance before I install open edit. So maybe we can wait for for a few minutes for the people to 
Yeah, yeah. So if this happened, you may you know to close your R R Studio and uh, open it again and then update your package and uh, those conflicts uh, will be solved. So I so I I just saw that the R Studio recently updated uh, the edition, so that may also cause some issue. Uh, as Rachel asked us to zoom in. Yeah, maybe maybe this is uh, better. So uh, yeah. Yeah, let let me know how you feel about the zoom. Uh, thanks. Uh, and uh, and the uh, question from Camilo. Uh, I must say this is oftentimes a pain, but uh, there are certain things that are still unclear why. Uh, on certain machines, it's uh, more difficult to to install. One of the reasons could be RStudio itself. Sometimes it has issues installing packages. So one uh, uh, like option for you to install more reliably is uh, using R itself. So just close RStudio, uh, go to R software alone. So it's uh, I hope I should be able to. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I will I will not manage probably to to jump on here, so um just just running in this kind of uh environment, uh just try to do the same thing. Uh, also, it can help just to restart the R Studio, uh, just because uh, this particle package was loaded. It can uh, cause issues. Uh, it can be also that uh, we found out that uh, if you have a Windows a Windows system and you installed your R within a C drive and in program files, uh, these program files can be protected from writing. Which is a really annoying feature, and it can cause uh, the issues when installing packages. So this is uh, just a few of the troubleshooting hints I would have, but uh, unfortunately, it's more difficult to to troubleshoot on distance. So I'm afraid we will have to move on, and you can at least watch the screen what's going on here. It'd be nice to have more. Anybody else having uh, different issues or? I guess we'll proceed to, to just um, show something here. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we have we have multiple chapters. Uh, we will see how far we can get. Maybe we can also stop it at some point and just uh, really focus on questions. Uh, from people uh, rather than going through through exercises that are already commented and, and just provided for you uh, to use later. Uh, this will be up to you, I guess, but uh, we can just uh, run the chunks and, uh, and see uh, what we can get in the, in the first chapter. Uh, the main focus is just uh, teaching you uh, basic, basic uh, data handling. Uh, skills. So, so basically, uh, using Open Eddy, uh, reading and writing data with Unit. So, so this is uh, just that uh, remind you that that you can basically use the Open Eddy package not only within the predefined workflows, but actually for any application when you are working with the Edit data, because oftentimes you will have the data saved together with Unit. So, if you you oh, so Camilo says that it worked out. Perfect. Okay. Uh, so, uh, just just uh, the description here. Uh, yeah. So so I think I, I covered some of that. We will work with the timestamp and how it should look like, uh, and also uh, how to subset. Yeah. 
yeah, how to fix it, that it. So here in the first code chunk, uh, this is just not very readable, but it's just to make sure that uh, uh, you have all the packages uh, that will be required that you have them installed. So if you don't have them installed, this script should achieve that uh, they will be on your machine. And here we are loading just those that we need for this particular chunk. Uh, in this uh, command, we are just making sure that uh, your working directory uh, will be uh, set to where the file, uh, this, this open edit tutorials, where the file is uh, placed. So uh, in order uh, to, to see where we are working at now, you can just write the command to get working directory and see uh, where you should place your files or, or the other, other way around where your files were placed and, and uh, how is now your working directory understood. You can also see the working directory here at this part of the last video. <clears throat> uh, so the first part is just uh, reading the data. Uh, so maybe it's uh, good to just go in the data and uh, see what is actually the structure uh, because it's easy to forget uh, that this data is sitting on your hard drive and uh, using just commands. Uh, okay. To, to see how, how like they actually look like uh, inside. So we have we have one uh, one row of um, of the header. Then we have one row with units, and uh, you can also see that the first column is a timestamp. This is not a requirement for it to be the first column, but timestamp column has to be included. So this is uh, just a very brief information. Um, it's actually, it has to be included uh, for uh, the workflow to be, to be just um, applicable for edit current data, but uh, actually you can allow, uh, sorry, you can read any kind of data frame. So, so it has to be just with either any units, but for our case, we also have the timestamp. You can also check the, um, uh, read any description to, to just uh, make sure that you understand uh, how this works. And it has multiple uh, settings, so you can just change those settings. Um, here is the here's the help file. So hopefully this will be informative enough. If you are missing some uh, information, just let me know if you arrive to some kind of issue. Uh, I'm happy to, to help you. Uh, there are descriptions of the settings. Uh, the command itself can look easy like this. So we just um, basically uh, load the data. Uh, it will take a little bit of time because it's a kind of big table. Uh, what is the read edit actually doing is extending the capabilities of uh, the read table, which is the base R function. And uh, it's uh, just changing certain settings and handling the, the units. So uh, anything that you are able to achieve with uh, read table should be achievable with read edit. Uh, now we can check uh, how the data look like. So just to expand a little bit here, this is the head of the file. So you have this kind of timestamp. Uh, you can see that the units are not presented here. Uh, they are, however, still conserved. And there is a list of all variables using the structure command. And you can see uh, that uh, there is always warnings uh, attribute and then also units attribute. Uh, these things travel with each column. So even if you separate the column from the data frame, it will still uh, describe uh, that variable. So we run this chunk. Uh, now we go into inspection of uh, how the uh, data uh, timestamp looks like. Uh, maybe I, I just uh, want to make sure that I'm running uh, in a uh, good enough zoom of the of the art video. Everything is visible. Uh, I hope people are seeing what is what is going on the screen. 
just um, shout out if you if you want uh, something to be different. Um, so in this in this case here, we have a timestamp still represented in the character vector. So this is uh, defined here or described here. You can also see the the uh, signs here. Uh, what we want to do actually is to convert from a character class uh, into POSIX format. And this can be done by strip time ID, which is again uh, kind of a extension of strip time function, which is in base R. But if we would uh, check what is actually happening uh, within the strip time ID, uh, you can you can understand that it uh, allows you to do additional validations of your timestamp. So basically, uh, in case that you have gaps in your timestamp. Uh, it will detect them and uh, give you error. Uh, there is also example showing you how to handle those cases later on in the tutorial. Uh, it will allow you to shift uh, the, the timestamp. So if you can see in this case, the original timestamp uh, was always logging the end of the half hour. So it's a half hour after midnight in this case, uh, but the measurements are representative of uh, 15 minutes, the, the middle of the averaging period is 15 minutes after midnight. So this is basically what we have done here in this case. So if we just if we just run this head here, you can see that we shifted uh, by 15 minutes backwards. So now it's correctly showing you the center of the interval uh, to which the flux should be actually assigned. Uh, you can also see that the class is now POSIX CP, which is a vector of uh, POSIX uh, format uh, time or date time information, uh, which is uh, good for storing in data frames. There is alternative POSIX LP, which would be list of timestamps, and this is not really working well in some cases uh, with data frames. So it's just a little bit. More info. Um, now, what you can see is actually, or you you might notice that uh, even though we have the var names and the units attributes assigned to each column, uh, during certain operations they actually might be dropped. It's not the case when we are subsetting at the uh, individual columns because these attributes travel with each column, as I was saying before. Uh, the problem is if you uh, try to subset across rows, which is the second example here. So we have uh, all the columns that were in the original data set, but we only substitute first three rows. And you can see that none of the columns has the units anymore and uh, no four names attribute the sign. So the variable names, uh, which is a short for names, uh, the variable names uh, were just dropped together with units. So in order to, to just uh, keep them, uh, we want to use the function x, which is defined in OpenID. And uh, if we subset using this function, all the attributes will be conserved. Uh, so the, to finalize this, this chapter, uh, we can just uh, return the timestamp into the original state. So we basically want to shift it back uh, or in a way shift it forward uh, to by, by 15 minutes uh, and, and again represent the end of the evolution period. And uh, then uh, from the POSIX T uh, class, we want to convert back to character, uh, which is done by format function. This is a base R function, so this is not a function of uh, OpenID, but uh, uh, it's useful to, to know this is how to operate with it. So we can just see once more that we are back into characters representing end of the averaging period. And now uh, we can just resave the data set. So basically we write the data with the units once more. Uh, into the drive. It will take a little bit of time, 
but uh, we can get uh, again any kind of uh, file type, uh, any kind of settings. You can just run the uh, either either you can actually control enter uh, on this um, question mark and name of the function. This will uh, show you the documentation file. Or you can actually put your cursor behind the function and press F1 in the RStudio environment, and it will do the same. So uh, this is the way how to get the uh, documentation for the for the functions. Uh, you can see that uh, there are multiple settings that you can that you can uh, uh, change. For example, uh, this is comma separated file on default, but you can uh, put tab uh, the uh, tab separated file. Uh, you can change your txt anything that you want. So. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, so here is here is just the um, uh, output. Yeah. So uh, let's speed it up a bit. Uh, here is an uh, example of how to merge files. Um, we just can produce two chunks of data. And uh, it will show us uh, that they are not. Uh, Continues, so there are some. There is a gap between them, and there is uh, a function with an open ID that uh, allows you to merge those. So you can see that now the timestamp is complete, uh, but we have certain rows uh, with any values to go in. Uh, so this is simplifying for you, uh, filling the gaps in the timestamp. Uh, so since we have uh, just not so much time, I guess uh, I will I will not go through uh, these more like technical things, but uh, go into uh, viewing uh, the data. Um, you can just visualize uh, the data set in multiple ways. Uh, one of the simple ones would be just using a base R. Uh, we will see what we have to do. Yeah. Uh, this is not uh, very helpful uh, because of the axis and so on. So uh, this is another alternative. Uh, plotting half hourly values with a little bit more of formatting, but still keeping the outliers and so on. You can see that there is the units uh, and um, Reformatting of the timestamp axis. Uh, you can uh, reformat it further using using additional commands. Now it's updated. Uh, but uh, what can be even better is actually to set certain uh, uh, certain quantile range that will be applied. So we are removing here one percent of the data. Uh, and uh, we just managed to display most of the uh, values that make reasonable impression how the data looks like. And uh, one of the most important uh, functions within OpenEDI to help you visualize how the data look like uh, is this uh, plot edit function. Uh, it will probably take a bit of time to, to load here because we are also recording. Uh, but it will basically, uh, yeah, here, here is actually only this one. Um, so it's uh, showing you all the used data. Uh, in this case, we uh, have a few grayed out values that are actually of the best quality. Um, this is with, without any QC applied yet. Um, or with, with not much QC if I did so. And here you can see the, the quality flags of, of the steady state integer plus characteristic uh, as display. So even though these are quite outlying values, uh, SSIPC is not giving them flag to, so this could be uh, amended later. Uh, this was a monthly resolution. 
So within the monthly resolution, you can get a quite a nice overview uh, about the about the whole data set. Uh, yeah, here is just a display of uh, how you can address the outliers. You can just limit the epsilon axis uh, to fit only those data that are reasonable. Um, And here we already uh, can see what are uh, how the how the data look like if you use the uh, weekly resolution. So so all the all the measurements here displayed are in weekly resolutions, and you can check with the methodological variables uh, if they are if they are behaving in a reasonable way. Uh, here is just to show that uh, basically you do not have to plot on flexes, but it can be also, um, concentration measurements, for example, uh, anything that uh, sounds reasonable to plot for you and you are interested in viewing. So, so you can you can get those easily like this. Um, another type of plot that is available in OpenID is uh, giving you additional statistics. This was originally designed to, to view the successful application of uh, planar fit. So here we can see the wind direction dependency of, uh, in this case, wind speed. Uh, you, could also, you could also see a vertical uh, wind component. Uh, so, so it allows you to, to provide uh, certain statistics uh, for uh, regularly uh, uh, or, or of the uh, even size bins. So within within each of the uh, bin here, you have the same amount of data. So uh, they get narrower in the in situations when uh, there is much more available. You can get also using this function very simple uh, light response curve. Uh, so just just to have a very a very brief overview about the quality control. Yeah, I was thinking actually we will go uh, two full hours, so I was maybe taking a bit too much time. So if we if we are supposed to finish in a few minutes, um, anyway, you have all the full uh, commentaries and you can go on your own. So it's not a big deal. Here is just an example of a user-defined uh, threshold for wind direction. So, for example, you have obstruction that you want to remove, uh, and it's between angles 270 and 290. Uh, you can uh, define this applied threshold uh, filter. Um, then you have to apply it. So, this is important to emphasize that you always first evaluate the filter. Uh, this will allow you to assign flags. Uh, after you get the flags, you have to apply them. So in this step, uh, in the step here, we obtain the flags. Here we are applying them to a new column. Uh, it's done now. And uh, now you can see the outcome. Certain values are removed. Yeah, so this uh, this angular uh, sector is, is just removed. You can still plot the original values if you want because uh, we have separate variable for that. Uh, you can also want to flag certain periods. So if you have, uh, for example, your logbook or you could say field notes, and it's telling you that there was some kind of malfunction and the measurements are not reasonable starting uh, in uh, August uh, until 20th of August. Uh, you can just define using this approach. You can see uh, the gap would be rather large. This is just for the tutorial purposes. And here is the example of how the Extraction of the quality control information uh, is um, achieved. Uh, this is basically a function that is um, taking all the tests uh, that are extractable from edit per output. So, this is, uh, I think, what uh, Xiangmin was asking. 
uh, most of the uh, most of the extractable information uh, is actually coming from Edipro, but not all of that. Uh, for example, if you have repeating values, it can mean that your sonic ammometer was frozen. Uh, this is uh, just done additionally by OpenID. Uh, you can have also uh, additional OpenID functionality to detect the low covariance in the measurements. So, for example, if your uh, any EE flexes are uh, so low that they basically resemble zero, uh, this is probably a case where the measurement was not successful anyway because the covariance couldn't be reasonably constructed. Uh, and the whole description again, you can just run the uh, extra QC uh, documentation file, and there is quite a lot of uh, information uh, summarized here. As I was already pretty sorry. Mm -hmm. Oh, can I ask you one quick question? So, if we when we run this kind of Q, QC um, code, and after that, can we uh, save this? Um, the, the flag as a like CSV file or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so basically what you will do is uh, in the complete beginning, you will load the data set. So you have metal data and uh, your yeah. edit for output. And then, yeah. you are, then you are including additional columns. So these oh. columns will be appended to the, to the original data. And then uh, when you are finished with all the stuff, uh, you will also append the columns with the uh, like filtered uh, um, flux uh, columns, and all will be saved together on your hard drive as a full QC finish. Okay, thank you. Yeah, good question. I mean, it's sometimes difficult um, to, to describe everything because uh, uh, it's hard to imagine uh what is uh, what 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 might be difficult to 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 understand about the process and, and these things so thank you for your questions uh, so in this case for example uh, we just uh save this uh flex into a qc object so it's not yet uh attached to the data file so uh, for example in the case of your question uh this one would be just going to this this qc object uh, in order to save it and continue working with it, you would need to do this command where we basically uh, create additional columns that have the names of the QC object. Uh, and we, we assigned uh, the, the QC to them. So, so basically you just uh, save. Uh, you just save the QC into, into your original data frame. Um, yeah, thank you. Oh, uh, this. Uh, I just mm -hmm. have one other question. So, among like in the CSV file, like, um, can I add some other variables? For example, like I work on like this methane, like data set from the Fluxnet. So, mm -hmm. this kind of new uh, variable can be also processed with this R code, right? Uh, so, so the thing is, uh, uh, I don't have any kind of. QC workflow that would be currently focused on uh, methane flexes. Ah. And this is something that we are discussing also with colleagues because we now have also some kind of uh, methane measurements um, okay. that could be addressed in this way. Uh, but uh, in general, it's possible. So, I mean, you can extract the same uh, statistical. Uh, the, the same statistics from Edipro, you could uh, apply similar types of filtering uh, also to methane, but if it will be really uh, successful in removing uh, the, uh, the spurious measurements, I cannot assure because uh, mm. this was not tested, right? So yeah. Also, oh. also the also the uh, new filters probably might be necessary for for the methane flux. I don't have much experience with that. Yes, thank you. Very helpful. But uh, the idea is uh, just that nothing is set in stone. Uh, this uh, workflow is adaptable. So if you feel like uh, some of the uh, concepts you can reuse, uh, I think I think it can be at least partly beneficial. Maybe it will not completely serve uh, like uh, 
uh, solve your your QC of meeting that uh, whether it's partly with the help. Yeah, I might think about how to how to address this because I think more of these questions will be coming. Um, originally, I wanted to focus on the basic four flexes uh, as every step I have done. Yeah, so, so I don't know if we, if we want to switch to uh, questions and answers, or should I be randomly picking further and we will see what questions come up or, or how, to, how to continue? Yeah, probably Xiaomi, we should like, like address uh, some questions and then end the seminar, right? Like, I think uh, there's one question from Rachel. Um, uh, will you hmm, be developing yeah, yeah, a I, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so it's basically similar to what you were asking. Uh, it's only not a meeting, but a role. And, and that's a good question. Uh, I think the answer is basically the same as, as for yours. Uh, the question is also, what is the scope of Open Eddy? I would have to think about this. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think it will be too high on my priority list because there is more things uh, that would need probably development. So um i'm not so sure how much deep i will go into this uh, there could be other types of flexes not only and to only maintain uh, then uh, <laughs> uh, the point would be probably just to demonstrate that there are some general functionalities of open ed uh, that can be applied also for other flexes um, and, and maybe approaching it like this so so uh, demonstrating the usability, uh, but not focusing, like refocusing on the uh, Yes, uh, so I guess now we will, uh, maybe you first uh, just quickly finish, uh, uh, finish all the things so we can have a look about the final result and then we can uh, just uh, stop recording and then maybe some people ask more questions, so we can finish everything uh, very quickly and stop the recording, and then we can have a free question and answer session for a few more minutes. Okay, so I can proceed a little bit further with the, with the tutorials. Uh, <clears throat> yes, I hope we can have a final look about how this uh, open added the final result and, and then we can stop recording for the final discussion okay. yeah the the outline is actually not uh, like uh, meant to arrive to some uh, final solution or like a final plot or anything it's just uh, uh, just uh, focusing on different use cases uh, that uh, are typical for uh, work with OpenID. And uh, one of them was uh, actually, as we can see in the outline, just reading and writing data with units. Uh, second one was merging data and filling gaps in timestamp. So if you have multiple types of uh, chunks of data sets, for example, uh, you can have multiple years of radical range measurements and uh, you are processing them separately year by year, but at some point you decide you want to make a multi-year time series. Uh, then you want to maybe merge them together. Uh, you might want to have different sources of your meteor data. Uh, they might be saved in smaller chunks. You want to com combine them together. So this merging of data can be, can be a useful, useful thing to, to learn. Uh, then uh, for the plot types, uh, we already only briefly just uh, jumped across uh, all the different types of plots. These were these were when you are showing basically time series uh, measurements, but there are also different plot types, uh, just uh, relevant to certain uh, other steps. Like for example, you can visualize this uh, quality control scheme, uh, which was already shown in the presentation. Uh, I can probably, yeah, I can show it uh, here. So, so basically, you can either summarize your QC in a tabular form, which you can see here. This is all the basically all the extracted uh, filters that are available available using this, this uh, particular extraction function. 
but you can also you can also view that as a lot. This is not sorry. This is not uh, making too much sense because we are mixing uh, filters for different types of uh, flexes, but uh, just just how this looks like in the in the bottom, you have the names of the filters, and then uh, color coded is uh, what are the flags, and and just very very quickly you can just find out that for example these tests are actually not available because they have an A values assigned, uh, and these. Uh, Filters are flagging quite a lot, so this is just very good uh, overview you can get out of this. So there are different plotting types within within OpenEdit that you can use for a benefit. Um, then there is um, flagging and removal of spurious measurements. This is uh, what we started here. Uh, so basically. Uh, to learn how to apply the filters and uh, how to how to. Um, define some user user defined filters. Uh, the important part here is just that the workflow is like this: you always uh, define which values uh, are spurious based on a certain aspect. So, for example, uh, if there is too much spikes uh, in the in the raw file, uh, you define how much is is too much. <laughs> and if you if you then uh, cross the threshold with uh, for this particular value, you will assign the flag to. So for each half hour, we have a flag uh, saying good data, bad data, basically. So we produce this column, and then uh, we uh, we have to apply this QC. So this flag is deciding which data is good and bad, and now we just based on it uh, remove the flag. So uh, this is the most basic approach. Uh, like upgrade of this is that you produce multiple filters and combine them together first, and only then you apply uh, to the filtering. So so the strategy uh, in the real case would be uh, produce filter, combine filters together, and then uh, exclude data. So this is this is basically the core message of this um, of this chapter here. I don't know if there is too much else. I just wanted to emphasize that the tribbles are really useful thing. Uh, this is basically a extended data frame. So tribble is uh, sorry tables are basically tables. Uh, this is this is like a Way how to remember them. Remember them. Uh, what it allows you is just that uh, you can the R here. The, the class is called table, but uh, the R here says that it's defined per row. So you can just do nice tables that are human readable already by looking at the file, and you can just define the QC scheme uh, nicely by using this this uh, table definition. So this is uh, here a very simple case for only one flux, but if you have four fluxes and each of them have different uh, setups, uh, it's easier to make it organized with, with the tribbles. Uh, if you want to see how more complex design looks like, you can just check the QC workflow on the GitHub. Um, so here, here the important uh, thing is also you can do the purely statistical outlier detection. So this is uh, the spiking function. It basically allows you to define uh, outliers based on the how it compares to the neighbors. So if your value is too much higher than the neighbors, it will be flagged as an uh, outlier. So if you have all the values around 100 and suddenly you have 1,000, uh, this, this test will catch up. So so this is uh, the spike uh, LF is for low frequency of the measurements because we have spikes in the high frequency data. Uh, we can have also spikes in the low frequency data. So this is uh, just to distinguish those two cases. Uh, this is 
purely statistical filter. So it doesn't say anything about what was actually happening. Perhaps this um, uh, spike is a very interesting uh, phenomenon that happened. Uh, it just doesn't have any power to tell you about that. Uh, it's just practical to remove uh, these outliers if you are uh, applying gap fitting, because for gap fitting, uh, large outliers can really affect the result. So, this is uh, one of the important things here. Uh, and then, uh, one of the functions that uh, I invested quite a lot of time in is the check manually function, which basically allows you to, um, sorry, we would need to run part of the codes here. I hope I can do this really in there. Yeah, I'm, I'm randomly jumping, so now it's, it's not so easy uh, to do, but, um, this uh, manual checking uh, basically allows you to, to do user interaction with the plot. So basically you just kind of view your plot, you can click on the screen and kind of say, this is outlier. Uh, you can define a range of values that uh, you want to be removed. Um, everything is saved into a separate uh, file. So even though this is the subjective part of the QC, that you might want to avoid, uh, but if it's necessary, at least you can rerun uh, the whole QC again next time because this uh, file will be reloaded from your hard drive. So this is uh, check manually. And the very last part that I try to cover in the tutorial is basically uh, the aggregations. Um, you can uh, you can run. Uh, Aggregations for I prepare this uh, for the R Edit Pro dataset, so this is not any more reliant on the data that I provided. Uh, yeah, I wanted to to show at least this part because this might be tricky. Uh, how the how the aggregation actually is implemented in uh, in Open Edit. Uh, basically, what is what is going on if we if we take the data set and look at the original uh, timestamp. You can see that uh, the resolution is uh, two seconds, basically. So we have a year, uh, month, day, uh, our minutes, seconds. Uh, so uh, actually, the aggregation will work over the same time steps. So, so if you have a row of ten timestamps that are identical, it will aggregate over them. So in this case, we would have none because this is all unique. So we actually have to reduce the the time resolution uh, of these timestamps, and this can be uh, achieved using format function. Uh, so we actually reformat this into that. So we only keep the year, which is here, and the month, which is here. And then actually we can see that if we view this reformatted time step uh, for the whole data set, uh, it's not ordered according to the months, but uh, here is January. You can see that there is uh, 1,500 records uh, that are with the same time step. So basically we filtered out only the January. Uh, this would be the whole February. So by reducing it, you just, uh, you just create this, this kind of uh, uh, time step that can be used in the aggregation. So in the end, uh, you can uh, create the aggregated means. So basically, uh, all the values that are here in January, that is 1,500 records, uh, are on this row. Uh, so why do we have here NA values? It's because it's non-gapful data. And uh, on default, you get NA when you have at least one NA record. Uh, here, if you decide this is not really a you know, problem for you, you can just uh, even aggregate uh, Regardless, using the NA ring, ring uh, argument. 
And here it's uh, a bit more tricky for the uh, summation uh, across different intervals because uh, summation typically requires certain unit conversions. So it's not very sensible to uh, aggregate uh, by summing across, for example, net ecosystem exchange in micromoles per meter square per second. You probably want to aggregate over grams of carbon per meter square per certain period. So this um, conversion is uh, done with an open eddy in automated way for the most common cases. Uh, again, the support is basically for the uh, sensible latent peak and uh, net ecosystem exchange. Uh, also, it's important to emphasize that these units they are assumed. So, so, so we always assume that any e is measured in a certain units. They are not checked. So, so if you measure your variable in some kind of other random units, I can imagine. That be, but uh, just be sure that you understand this is only based on assumptions, uh, this conver conversion. Uh, also, signs are corrected. So, for example, NEE, if you are talking about uptake, uh, it's given in uh, negative values, but we are actually producing NEP, so it's net ecosystem productivity. So, also, there is a renaming. And uh, actually, if we Remove the NA values, which shouldn't be done here because this is sums, but just for demonstration. So for the for the productive months, you can see that the values are positive. So there was a conversion. Yeah, so you can you can actually aggregate using arbitrary functions. So you can, for example, produce a minimum and a maximum per given interval. So uh, this will allow you to create these kinds of uh, plots where you have uh, maximum, minimum, and uh, the average of air temperature. And I think the, the most time consuming thing, if you wanted to re implement on your own, uh, is the uncertainty uh, estimation. Uh, Thomas Musler has a really nice um, tutorial on, uh, on his GitHub where he is uh, uh, trying to explain how to go about it. Uh, there are certain technical uh, nuances when you want to consider that the values are correlated. Uh, there is uh, a bit more uh, steps in the in the process, but basically we are using the standard deviation uh, estimation uh, obtained from uh, our Ediproc package. So, so the package that Thomas Wiesler designed is uh, in a way producing a byproduct uh, that we can then uh, really use to estimate the, the uncertainty. And uh, this can be demonstrated once once these computations are finished, hopefully soon. Yeah, I guess there is so this uh, useful step here. We can we can create easily bar plots uh, of of the aggregated aggregated values. Somehow my computer is much slower now. Is yeah, this is the summing things and aggregating is very useful. And I think we only have like five minutes left. So maybe um if you could just answer one more yeah. question from Rachel mm -hmm. um in, on the in the chat box and maybe Xiang Xiang we can wrap it up in five minutes. Mm -hmm. um, while we are waiting for that result. <laughs> So there is a question from Rachel for the yeah. gap filling. Do you need measure to meet data without not gaps? 
Uh, I think it's meant meteor data uh, with no gaps. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so I think this is a very important question that maybe I should be also uh, emphasizing more. Uh, this is uh, this is actually a setup that is uh, already using a gap filled meta variables. So, so you are correct that uh, I am not actually too much testing how it would perform if we didn't have the gap filling done uh, for the meta files. But uh, concerning the open eddy, uh, most of the times uh, you can you can run the functions uh, without issue even if you have uh, smaller gaps in the metal. Uh, but uh, for RD proc, uh, you, can, uh, you can actually get fill using the RD proc itself. So, uh, so the basic metal variables, uh, they can be get filled by the tool. Uh, so first you actually get filled the metal, and then you proceed to get filling the flexes. If this is... Uh, Again, the, the thing is that uh, the gaps should be of the reasonable size, so very small gaps are easy to take off uh, if you have uh, huge gaps in the metal. Uh, this is very unfortunate because it's uh, difficult then to, to work with the data, but uh, there could be associated stations uh, and you could create some kind of correlations. But this is usually a bit more complex setup that is required and uh, is expected to be done uh, by the by the PI of the station. It's common separately. Great, thank you. Shamin, should we stop recording or are you going? To... Uh, yeah. So so now I guess we are waiting for the final result. But uh, yeah, I want to, to say something. To wrap up our seminar and then I will stop recording and then maybe after that if uh, if some people have more questions and uh, because we stop the recording so it's more it's um, much less pressure to re talk uh okay yeah so so I think uh, it's a very uh informative seminar and uh, I, I feel the open edit package is so powerful and then the a lot from this seminar and uh, I I yeah so so I I would uh, appreciate our speaker speaker last uh Shinat for for his uh, uh support for our seminar and uh, also for his authoring of this very powerful elegant package and it can produce very good uh Fingers and uh, it can have very easy process, uh, easy to to process those complicated uh, ad occurrence data. So, so for all, I feel that's a very helpful, informative, uh, comprehensive seminar. And uh, and thank you very much. That is enough for your uh, very informative presentation. Now I will. Stop a recording and uh, we will see. Uh, yeah, so if you have a further question, this is the email address from from that staff. Uh, uh, so you can also ask him question after we finish our seminar. So now I will stop a recording and uh, we can wait for.